Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Dr. James Madden. He goes by Jim. Um, he recently wrote a book called, if, I'm trying to, if I remember it properly, it is Mind, Matter, and Nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and the subtitle is A Thomistic Proposal for the Philosophy of Mind. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this book and you know, the relevant subjects that follow from it. So, um, Jim, just introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, my name is Jim Madden. Uh, my wife and I have lived with our family in Atchison, Kansas for the last 17 years. Actually, I think it's 17 years this weekend. And um, I teach at Benedictine College here in Atchison. Um, and yeah, so Mind, Matter, Nature, I think it was published in 2013, right? Yeah, so um, not so recent, right? <laughs> but recent enough, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, so the book obviously covers the philosophy I'm very of mind. Happy to be here. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I interrupted you. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyways, so, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I really appreciate you, your interest in, in talking to me. So. Yeah, no problem. Is there like a, is there kind of like a lag between us maybe? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think so. I think I just talked over you. <laughs> okay. It's okay. All right. <laughs> well, so the book obviously covers the philosophy of mind and I was interested because you know, the book seems to be structured as kind of um, almost like a, a attempting as comprehensive as possible, right? An analysis of the different perspectives that are there. So I wanted to ask you, um, what debates should we be aware of in the philosophy of mind? Like what should someone have the background knowledge of in order to understand your book? And even, you yeah. know, the, the thesis that you're setting forward. Yeah. Okay. So as far as the book goes, uh, my intent originally to write in writing that book was to write a very, very basic introduction book, introductory book to the philosophy of mind that um, had, you know, where, wherein hylomorphism was a player. Out there, but the, my concern about them was that it was, you know, here's the philosophy of mind and then, and then here we're just going to throw hylomorphism on at the end. Right. Okay. And my view is that's actually the wrong way to look at it. And we'll probably get into this is that uh, hylomorphism is not a philosophy of mind. It's a philosophy of nature. Okay. Um, and if you're going to do it, you've got to do it bottom up, top, bottom, all full encompassing worldview if it's going to work. Okay. And that's not necessary to, to criticize the other people who would work on it. it uh, it's hard to do everything in an introductory book, okay? So when the book went to blind review, um, and this happens a lot, I think, when, when you get a book blind reviewed, is it, you, the project kind of gets sucked into directions that you don't necessarily want it to go into in, because the reviewers are raising good issues and you, know, you need to reply to this, you need to reply to that, you need to make this. So suddenly what was going to be a very small, short and sweet rated G introduction becomes like a PG-13 borderline rated R, right? Uh, much more, much bigger book. Okay. So actually the, the, that book got away from me. I'm still hoping to write the rated G book, right? Okay. Um, and so, but, all right. So my, my, I'm sorry, that's a long answer to this question. But, uh, my original plan was that the book would not presuppose anything. Like anybody could pick it up and read it and do, but you know, that's a fable that I think, you know, academics tell themselves that they're going to write that book. But, you know, hopefully you could open that up if you have some basic philosophical training and, and you could just be get the by doing it okay um does that make sense yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um now in terms of i guess when you ask uh you know what should we be aware of you know in the philosophy of mind you know and i guess it depends on who the, the we are and we can talk about that too but um philosophy of mind is a very big place all right and it's much bigger place than i than i lead on in that book right where i i I, I come at it from a very parochial uh, set of considerations and kind of tip my fingers into the other areas here and there. Okay. So I, the way I think of philosophy of mind now, especially, you know, some years later is, is, is in terms of two different types of concerns. Okay. So on the one hand, um, you have your classic mind body problem, right? You know, where we're, we're really doing metaphysics here, we're doing ontology, you know, so, in our inventory of things in the universe, you know, 
uh, if we are we going to put the mind into you know the bucket with immaterial things? We're going to put it in the bucket with the material things, and you know what are the metaphysical consequences of that? Okay. Philosophy of consideration, right? I think it's less a concern about metaphysics. It's just a question of like when we say something has a mind, right? Or when we when we talk about particularly human mindedness, what are we saying about it? And what are the different categories of thought? And and how do they overlap with other things? And and you know how do we distinguish emotions from acts of will from um, from from uh, thoughts with cognitive content and that sort of thing? Okay, I do very little of that in the book, but a lot of philosophers of mind, that's what they do. And in fact, if you want to get into uh, you know, the, with science and empirical disciplines, that's the sort of thing where philosophers are talking to uh, other disciplines in very interesting ways. I think that's probably where most of your very important, interesting work in artificial intelligence is going on, right? And really, in, in more recent years, that's kind of where I've been thinking mostly myself. Yeah. All right. Well, so we can uh, just dive right into um, one of the main questions that I think you take on, um, like really early on in the book, which is the, I think it's, um, well, actually, so the roster that I have actually begins with asking about um, good reasons for believing in the immateriality of the intellect, right? Yeah. So against emergentism, and yeah. I think the other view is materialism, right? Those yeah. two views. Yeah. So, um, and, and this might be unfair to the viewer because I'm gonna kind of parse exactly how you put the question on, on the Google Doc. Sure. And, and I'm gonna be picky here, because you know, that's like what we do, we're philosophers, right? And, but this is a picky thing that I think, I'm picking at myself of 2013 in as much as I'm picking at you right now. All right. Okay. So, I, because I a lot of us make right that I that I made my make myself too okay so on the one hand we, when we say yeah are there arguments for the immateriality of the intellect and then gloss that by saying arguments against materialism and naturalism okay and I think one can have a really good argument against materialism and a really good argument against naturalism mm -hmm. without having any kind of argument for the immateriality of some entity Okay. Does, does the distinction make sense there? Okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, fairly blown away by a paper by Elizabeth Anscombe that was published posthumously. It was a, a lecture she gave. It wasn't hidden or anything like that. Um, where she made this point about how you know, and I think she's you know, she's talking to probably Thomas like her husband, right? Um, about how you know, it's one thing to say we we say the the intellect is immaterial in the sense that there's no material account of it, okay? It's another thing to say that the intellect is an immaterial object, right? Uh, and I think the way she puts it in the paper, she says, you know, so we could say um, thinking is immaterial in the sense that there's no material object that does the thinking, okay? But that's different from having an argument to say that there's an immaterial object that does thinking, okay? And I think uh, Anscombe's view and I think Wittgenstein's view, uh, I'm, I'm certain of that, is that thinking is not something done by a single discrete object at all. Okay. Okay. So, and it's become very important to me that we make sure we like distinguish these kinds of arguments. Am I arguing just to say that there's not a material account to be given of thinking? Okay. Or am I saying that we need an immaterial thing in order to give an account of thinking? Okay. Mm. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. I think the former is a lot easier than the latter. It's a lot easier than the latter. Okay. And, uh, and th this is how I've, I've more recently begun to make that argument. Okay. Um, my, my wife teaches psychology and, uh, she, she, she brought home the textbook that her, her department like mandates that she uses in her intro class. And, uh, in, in one of the early chapters, it was, it was the chapter on, on, on brain, on, on a brain structure and all that. There's, a, there's an fMRI of, of a brain in activity, and it says, the caption says something about, this is a picture of a mind, okay? Hmm. Uh, and, and, it, you know, and it's an fMRI mind. Now, now, never mind, it's not even a picture of a brain, okay? It's a, <laughs> it, it's, it's a second order image, right? But, so it, this is a picture of a mind, and, you know, 
I think that's about the silliest thing one could say, okay? Um, because there's all sorts of content to mind that is not captured in that picture. Right, okay, am I looking at a mind? Well, um, what, do we, what would it mean to have, say, a picture of a mind, right? Okay, well, I think what you'd have to say, at least I have a picture of something that is a sufficient condition for there being a mind. So if all, I, if all I knew about the world is you had that thing in the picture, that was there, there would be a mind there, okay? Um, then I think, yeah, you could say you have a picture of a mind and that would be, that'd be something like saying materialism was true about minds, right? Um, and so just, let's just say the, the, the total state that the brain is in there is, you know, or the, the organism that has that brain is, is thinking about Paris. Okay. All right. Um, and I, I just, you know, just to greatly simplify, let's just call that state of that brain Zeta. Okay. So if you're going to say that's a picture of a mind, right? What you're saying is all that we need for there to be a thought about Paris is that you have a brain and it's in Zeta period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but I mean, a caveman, in 100,000 BC, before Paris ever ever uh, existed, and by some quirk he gets hit in the head, and his brain enters in state zeta. Right? Um, he's not thinking about Paris. Right? Right? There's no Platonic form of Paris that that brain state was evolved to deal with. Right? Do, do you see my point? Okay. Um, if you know, you know, so uh, if just you, so my my point being is is that the brain state is not itself sufficient for the Paris, right? There has okay. You could say, well, couldn't someone imagine in a possible world when Paris has ever been uh, the city of Paris? Well, I think it's open question whether they're thinking about Paris or they're thinking of an image or something else. Do you see my mm. point? Okay, but even then, I, I think it still works. So my point being is, is you can't say the brain state alone is sufficient uh, for there to be a thought about Paris. Uh, so, you know, first is I, I've never been to Paris. Okay. Um, so what does it mean for me to be in a, in a, in a, a state of thinking about Paris? Well, it's certain pictures that had certain conversations with people, right? It's for me to have speak, a, speak an English language where we use the word Paris, right? And, you know, as opposed to, you know, how it, it would be translated in other languages and all this, right? Um, and if you start looking at all the conditions that have to be in place to make that brain state a brain state that's referring to Paris, uh, I don't think it's possible to give any kind of account, right? Any kind of final account of what it is to have a thought about Paris, just in terms of something discrete and internal to this organism. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I think, can, can we ever give a, a material account of what it is to have a thought about Paris? I don't think we can, okay? Um, because the conditions for a thought about Paris are gonna, I mean, so if, uh, you know, Charles Martel loses a battle, right? In the early medieval period, right? What it is to have a thought about Paris is very different for us right now. Mm. And that, that it would have been different for us now than it is then, right? So like, the conditions that set the content for, for a thought to be about Paris and for that brain state to be related to the world in that way, okay? Uh, so my view is that thoughts don't arise from a single discrete event internal to an organism. It's, it's always an organism in relationship to an entire history of the world, right? A, a language, a culture, a set of institutions, a biological history, all of this, okay? So I think, I think once you accept that, you accept that kind of ex really extreme externalism about content of mental, of mental, of thoughts, pardon me. Uh, once you accept that, the idea that you're going to give a naturalistic account, right, or a materialistic account of anything, I think that's just, that's a dead letter. Okay. But that's, that's different from jumping to now, being something mm -hmm. immaterial does it too. All right. Yeah. Do you see my point? Okay. Yeah, I definitely see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Might have, it it might have been just a slothfully written question, you know, something else. No, 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 no. It's not. It's not at all. It's not at all. It's just this is kind of my stalking horse now. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, and, and here's why I think this is important. Okay. So I'm not saying 
So I think that I think this is one of the things that leads a lot of debates in philosophy of mind to be become very more okay is because um, you immediately say, look, you know, there, there's there's you say, take, take the qualia problem, right? Okay, so you know, uh, I just drink coffee, right? And you know, so there's this taste of coffee, but you know, clearly, you know, Thomas Nagel's example: if you lick my brain after I eat chocolate, nothing will taste like chocolate, right? Okay. Um, not my example. Right? If you look at my brain right now, you're not going to taste. You're not going to taste coffee. So where is the taste of the coffee? Okay. So that's that's. It's easier than say, yeah. There's there's nothing in a single discrete account internal to this organism that's going to tell you what coffee tastes like. And clearly, coffee does have a taste. Okay. But that it's a big jump then to go from that to oh, there must be some other entity riding along that's having the taste of coffee. Right. It could be. I think it's easier to do this in the case of thought. It's that there's this very complicated relationship certain kinds of organisms are, have to the entire world, okay? And so um, I get, what I'm getting at here is in, we don't have to see it as, and I think this is one of the things that, like, that, that pushes people away from any step back second entities that are competing in accounts with the, the physical entities and all of this, right? We might just be admitting that um, what it is to have a thought is just far more complicated than just one event going on in a single organism. Mm. Did you see that? Right? Yeah. And and for the kind of problem that's become interesting to me, um, even if you said, yeah, well, then the thought's going on in in a, in sort of like a Cartesian mind, right? Well. Once again, like, you know, okay, and so how is it that my Cartesian mind has content about Paris? Well, it's only because it's entered in this complicated relationship, right? Whether it's prior history of the world, all of this stuff, right? Or if a caveman's Cartesian mind, right, uh, you know, uh, somehow, you know, could, could it enter into a thought about Paris if Paris had never existed and all this stuff? And I think you're going you're gonna to have to say that would be silly, right? So once again, either way, what a thought is, is to occupy a place in a world. Um, and so for me, it's, it's more important to kind of turn over this idea that thinking is something that goes on internal to us, right? And not our participation in a world, a history, a culture, what have you. Okay. Right. Now, uh, <laughs> that being said, okay, do I think we can make arguments for the immateriality of the intellect? Okay. I do. Okay. Um, but once again, though, what I'm so let me let me rewind a little bit here. Okay, so I, um, you you know, so I, I wrote Mind, Matter, and Nature, and uh, you know, I defended a hylomorphic account, and I still think a hylomorphic account is defensible, right? But I also, you know, in, in the intervening years, you know, I've 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 gone back and I've I kind of started over. Okay, I went back and I, and I looked, started, started reading back. I, basically, the way I'd originally gone is I read from Thomas back, and now and I started reading from Aristotle up. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And so the way I read Aristotle now in terms of immateriality of the intellect, okay, is you know, if you get a damn reading of what Aristotle's up to there, he's going to say, well, um, human beings are able to be impressed by, right? Like literally take in to be in this relationship to a world, okay? That includes more than just the particular and the contingent, right? It, it, it also includes for human beings, the universal and the necessary, okay? And on Aristotle's view, um, what it means to, uh, being kind on us, we're going to become it in some way. Okay, so you, you've heard this phrase, the knower becomes the known. Okay, and so in Aristotle's view is in order for us to know something, right, we have to in some way become it. Okay, and we can talk about that because it's really weird and spooky, right, okay. And so in as much as there is something absolute and necessary and eternal, right, okay, uh, it, and human beings can know what that absolute and necessary and eternal thing is, then it would seem that we have to be able to become absolute 
that's this question of whether or not there's an immaterial intellect or whether or not you know human beings you know or, or at least our rational aspect would survive death becomes less now a question for the philosophy of mind and more of a question for natural theology mm. okay is there something universal eternal and absolute right um and if there is it would seem then you know, just by the fact that we've arrived at that conclusion, we're reaching it. And so then it would seem that, that in fact, the intellect is immaterial in that sense, right? Do, do, do you see that? Mm -hmm. So more recently, I'm again, like based in things that we find in philosophy of mind and, and, and more to say, look, if indeed the universe is such that a, that a classical theist thinks it as, then it would seem then, then here we are knowing something universal and eternal, which would then mean something about us is universal and eternal. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, so if you look at the way Aristotle proceeds, he doesn't begin inside out, it's outside in. Like, what is it that human beings take in? And then, oh, wait, some of that seems to be this, these, these absolutes will then seem that human beings have to become absolute in a way in as much as they grasp it. Right? Mm -hmm. So once again, it, it, I, I like to think about it as human beings possess an immaterial and immortal intellect to the degree that we reach out to something immaterial and immortal. Right? Hmm. Right. Yeah, it, you know, it reminds me of, um, you know, I think St. Thomas talks about like when you when you actually know and grasp something in reality, there's like a formal identity yeah. between yeah. your intellect and the object that you grasp. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's yeah. that's going back to Aristotle. Right. Yeah, I know it definitely it definitely does. Yeah. yeah. And, and once again, this could be my weird reading of De Anima. Okay. I'm perfectly open to that. And I don't read the Greek, so I'm happy to be corrected. Okay. Uh, and then how you how you map that onto how Thomas reads De Anima and what Thomas does, but that's that's a complicated question, right? But I think I think once again it's important. Um, and maybe we'll get into this as we go on, if we're not going to just simply rehearse what I see to be the grave errors of dualism, then I think the primary error is to begin an account of mind internal to us and not begin an external. Uh, I think it's important that, you know, even when we start thinking about the immaterial, what we're talking about here is that's internal to humans, right? So I see having a thought is always to relate myself to something external to me, right? Uh, and having the kind of thought that would show me to be, you know, immaterial would then be, ha can I have thoughts that relate me to things that are immaterial? Mm. All right. Let me, um, sorry. Uh, thank you for uh, being patient. So I had to no, swap no. out the connection and everything. So um, we are now talking about, well, on the raw, uh, on the docket, I have it as uh, the advantages and the drawbacks yeah. of dualism. So let's just, let's just talk about dualism now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you know, like, like any, you know, if you ask me, you know, what do you think of materialism? You know, there's there's so many brands of materialism. Likewise, there's so many brands of dualism. Okay, what I'm going to mean by dualism here is the idea that that an entity that a mind is an entity, uh, a discrete, individuated entity, right, uh, distinct from a human body, okay, or or, or an organism body, okay. Uh, such that if you're going to count the the individuated entities, you know. And it's hard because minds aren't spatial, supposedly, right? Then in this chair, in the vicinity of this chair, right? And can, it, then you would count twice: one for my body, one for my mind. Okay, all right. So that, that's what I'm going to do. My dualism. You could talk about property dualism. You could talk about cognitive dualism, which I find a very interesting position. Um, might even actually be my position. Um, but I think what we generally mean by by dualism is substance dualism, and by that we mean that you know minds are individuals distinct from bodies, right? Maybe in special relationships to bodies, but they're they're distinct from bodies. Okay. Um, okay. So the advantages, uh, you, you want to kind of what are the advantages of, of dualism, right? I mean, the advantages is it, is it, it they dualism might just be more honest to a certain set of, a, of facts that materialism is not. Okay. So, you know, going back to my example, you know, I mean, a dualist is not going to look at an MRI and say, Oh, that's a picture of mine. Right. And not going to fall into like these easy ways we can lampoon that. Right. Okay. Um, and you know, in, in dualists are not going to have to, you know, go through the kind of acrobatics that we see a lot of contemporary materialists go through just to try to find a place for where mindedness or mental properties can fit into an account of the world. Okay. 
so it has that advantage, right? It, I think it lets us be honest that there, there, that there is something under the heavens and earth, right, that can fit into a materialist philosophy, okay? Um, okay, so that being said, right, I'm not a huge fan of, of that position, okay? And what I worry about at the most is really uh, uh, mind-body interaction, okay? And I think my, my worries about it have become more, uh, you know, become deeper than they were when I wrote the book, okay? I mean, although they're in the book, right? Um, and so I, that, that seems to be the downside, okay? And, and, you know, I think really the worry about it is, it's not that I think mind-body interaction is impossible. It's just that the, the kinds of stories we have to tell about the universe to make sense of it, right? becomes so, so complicated. It makes dualism so theoretically heavy that it seems to pay to start looking for something else mm -hmm. uh, in our account, right? Okay. Um, and I'll just, maybe I'll give you a, a sense of the flavor of what I worry about in my body interaction, okay? So let's say right now, it, you know, if you want to say that I have uh, events in my mind that are distinct from my body, Right, my, in my body, my mind is distinct from my body that somehow causally affect events in my in my body, in the same sense in which one billiard ball can collide into another billiard ball. Right, then it seems that you're going to have to say that at some point, you know, detectable point in time, there's going to be this total distribution of of you know sodium and potassium and lipids in my brain. Okay, uh, for which there is not a complete physical causal explanation in terms of a prior distribution of, of physical properties, right? In my brain or, or things interacting with my brain. Okay. Um, and it just doesn't seem like we're finding anything like a gap like that in, in this series of causes going on in a human nervous system. Right. And everything, I mean, everything we know about nature, you know, since the 17th century is telling us there, there's not a lot of gaps out there like that. Okay. You can get into quantum indeterminacy and all that, but then you do these questions like, well, these micro effects have macro. It, it, it just invokes more problems from philosophy of science and once again, we're getting heavy here, right? But it's that that I worry about. I think that if we're gonna be seriously substance dualist, then, then we're, we're predicting that at some point a neuroscientist is gonna say, aha, there's the gap, right? There's a, there's a physical distribution in the brain. And there's no physical cause for it. That must be where the soul's going, right? Doing. And then we're back to, you know, Descartes and the pineal gland and all that, right? Um, and so that for me is the dual, the deal, I was a dual breaker, the deal breaker on substance dualism. Mm. Right. right. So then what you're basically arguing is that um, not only is there like this, in, if you will, almost empirical disconfirmation of it, but more seriously, if you try to fill in the gap or try to find the gap, then you have to take on just so much, if you maybe theoretical baggage. Yeah. And it, it just gets yeah. really complicated, really fast. It's really complicated, really heavy. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying you don't have a similar set of theoretical acrobatics, as I put it, going on on the material side. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, but what's happening is, is the way this debate in philosophy of mind is going in, in the mind-body problem. I think there's great fruit being done in the cognitive science problem side of philosophy of mind, but in the, in the mind-body problem side of it, you just get more and more theoretically heavy, technically you know, heavy accounts which then, you know, I think we're lowering our overall probabilities here by adding more to it, right? On yeah. either side of the debate, the materialists would do this debate, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, uh, uh, well, I was going to say that too, like um, in metaphysics, simplicity is generally regarded as a, as a desert, uh, desideratum, right? Yeah. For any yeah. theory that you have, so. Yeah, or it's eight, it's one of them, right? Yeah. You know? right? The, the simplest theory doesn't win. It's the simplest theory that managed to ex explain everything. Mm, yeah. yeah, so, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, and, 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 you know, since I, I don't think we're getting absolute demonstrations either way here, right, then I think, you know, simplicity does play in here, okay. Um, and now, look, I don't think, I mean, I don't think you're some raving lunatic if you're a substance dualist, right? So, if, you know, you told me my kids are going to grow up to be substance dualists someday. I think I could live with that, right? We could get through Thanksgiving, right? Okay, <laughs> right, you know, but I think, I, think there's, I think there's brands of materialism. I don't think you're a, a raving lunatic to hold, right? Okay. Um, and, you know, if I found out my, you know, my, my kids would be materialists, but yet theists or something like that, you know, we could, we could, we could get along, you know, right? you know the grandkids come by. Um, but, you know, you know what I mean? So I, uh, but I, I find dualism, the primary thing for me is, is the interaction problem 
and how how heavy it gets to try to solve it. Mm-hmm. Right. But you know, I think it's interesting. Um, and once again, this is you know, this is as much confessional on my part as it is it me picking at you. Is it's funny we begin by asking why are you or are you not a dualist? Like that's the default position, especially for Christians, right? Mm. That's the default position, right? But no, like dualism is a reaction to modernity, right? Or, or modern science, right? It's, a, it, it's, it's this reactionary position that comes late in, in the history of, you know, philosophy and comes late in the history specifically of Christian thought and stuff like that. And I, I think it's very odd that we, we almost have to justify ourselves in not being dualists, right? Um, when we should see this as this is a it's a very foreign Johnny come lately kind of position. Mm. All right, well then let's dive into um, your Aristotelian hylomorphic yeah. account of mind. So just describe yeah. to us uh, once again, you know, yeah. um, what how how are you approaching the question from this hylomorphic account? And you know, mm-hmm. um, illumine us, right? Yeah, on, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's a uh, useful. So 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 here too, I, I want to be very careful because I don't. I don't see um, hylomorphism as a philosophy of mind. Yeah. Okay. I think it, it's a general philosophy of nature. It's a general metaphysic that has great consequences for philosophy of mind, right? And if you, you want to go back to Aristotle, you know, the, you know how this comes up is he, you know, he writes, uh, assuming the ordering the text that we have them is historical, but you know that's above my pay grade for that, right? But you, know, you get you, in the physics, you, you get a general account of the matter form relationship. Right, and then and then we move into the the properly biological books, right? And then he starts applying that to these different biological disciplines, and that's where we get you know start talk of of mind there. But it, it's far down the road. Like hylomorphism has this credential f- before it, it comes up for him as something the philosophy of mind, right? And when in here, and when he gives an account of his own thinking, you know, in the metaphysics, he starts out in the philosophy of nature and moves it forward in these other areas okay so i think that's really important okay because um you know for a hylomorphist the question isn't how we're going to fit mind into nature right in the way that it is for a dualist right Mm -hmm. so we've got this mechanized view of nature now that comes with modern science but mind doesn't fit into that what are we going to do how are we going to fit that in there okay that's the history of philosophy of mind in the modern period okay so Aristotle, you know, and hylomorphists in general are very impressed by the fact that material objects are not identical to the collection of their parts. Okay. I think that's, for me, that's, that's the first premise. Okay. And this is, this is a really unfortunate example. And, uh, you know, every freshman at Benedictine College is, is scandalized when I do this. Okay. But we're going to do it. Okay. So um, if I take a cat, uh, and, and I throw it through a wood chipper, okay? <laughs> On the far side of the wood chipper, I have all the parts. All the pieces to the cat are there, okay? Um, but what remains is not a cat, all right? It's, you know, stuff that could be a cat, but it's not a cat, okay? And so that, I mean, the point, I mean, it's, it's, it's a scandalous way of making this point that clearly uh, a material object is not just the same thing as the collection of its parts. And same thing, the desk I'm sitting at right now, if we took it, you know, let, let's stand and we chopped up the desk, we could, we could preserve all the material parts to it. Um, but we really have to strain to still call that a desk. Okay. All right. And so that leads Aristotelians in general um, to make this distinction between the matter of a thing and the form of a thing. Okay. I just want to be careful, you know, uh, I kind of wish we had a different word for this um, when I use the word matter here, okay? Because um, matter in, in, for Aristotle, and I, I really believe for St. Thomas later, is this sort of functional concept, right? So matter is just whatever does a certain kind of work, okay? And so what is matter? It's the stuff that composes something that pre-exists that thing and could post-exist that thing, okay? So, you know, the matter of the cat is whatever it is you have at the far side of the wood chipper. Why? Because, well, we know that same stuff was there when you had the cat and the same stuff is there when you don't have the cat, right? Or the matter of the desk, you know, is the wood because we know you had that wood before, right? Now you still have it when you have the desk and you could still have it when the desk is no longer with us, right? If we smashed it, okay? So it, it, it then seems like you've got, you've got this... Um, 
there's a sense in which the matter is not the the, the entity, it's not the substance, right? Because it, it can be without that substance being. But also you can see too that the substance is not the matter and, and going in the direction because take your cat, right? That cat is constantly exchanging matter um, with the world, right? It's, it's taking in food, it's, you know, it's uh, returning matter to the, to the environment afterwards, right? Uh, it's shedding hair, all this stuff. So you can't say at any one moment, even that cat is identical to the collection of matter that composes it right now, because it's going to be composed by other, um, you know, collections of matter throughout its history. Okay. So all that is a long story to say. So you cannot say um, material objects, even artifacts in, in a lot of cases, just are the material parts. They're the parts plus something else. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Aristotle, in, you know, in a word that is probably the most abused word in the history of philosophy, um, so that he calls that the form. Okay, that's the form. So what is the form? The way I think of the form, it's whatever it is you have to have present in addition to the guts on the far side of the wood chipper in order to make that thing a cat. Okay. Um, you know, what is the form of the desk? It's whatever you have to have present in addition to the, the screw and the woods, et cetera, et cetera, right? Such that you have a desk, okay? Now, an important point here, and a very important point, and, and maybe one I, I would have done better to emphasize in the past, is the form cannot be an additional part, okay? Yeah. Because like what, yeah, all right, okay, so what we're looking for here is an account of what makes all those parts form one thing, okay? And if you say, well, it's this other part, right? Uh, and you, well, it's an immaterial part. Well, that's not going to do it, right? So now you still have this question of like, what makes those all one thing? Okay, so whatever a form is, right, it's not going to be a part. Okay, all right. Um, and you know, so Aristotle at times will say it's the organization of a thing, right? It, you have to have the cat matter organized in a certain way. You have to have the the desk matter organized in a certain way. Okay. And once again, I think uh, the way I think about it is, is a form is some, it's, it's a functional concept. It's whatever does that work. It might vary from different types of substance to others, right? Okay. Um, but whatever it is that I have to add to the story to get a certain kind of entity, as opposed to just the matter of potential for that entity, that's the form. Okay. So as a general kind of like, like what motivates holomorphism, does that work? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now. Um, so if you look at, um, so Aristotle is very interested in the physics, right? With the distinction between a natural thing and an unnatural thing. Okay. And, um, you know, that's sort of the most boring question for us. Cause obviously if we make it, it's unnatural. Right? And, if it, and if we find it, it's natural, but it's really, it's not a very good way of making the distinction. Okay? So the way Aristotle makes the distinction between something that's natural and unnatural is a natural thing is something that has its principle, okay? Uh, we'll talk about what you mean by that. Internal to it, okay? It has the principle of its motion and rest is internal to it, okay? And so what Aristotle means by that is a natural thing is something that moves itself in the sense that it, it has ends, it has purposes, okay? And it, and it pushes itself towards those ends and purposes, okay? And also he says it rests, okay? So it's subject to a certain kind of self-directed change and it also rests, it resists change in a certain way, okay? So the way I think of it for Aristotle is, is a natural thing is something that can prosecute its interests, okay? And it can also re resist entropy all on its own. That's a natural thing. Okay. And um, so, so for instance, um, if you asked Aristotle, you know, is, uh, you know, a chameleon, a lizard, right? Is, is, is that a natural thing? Yeah. Cause chameleons, they go out and they do the chameleon thing. Like they're pushing themselves to prosecute the interests of, of chameleons in a way distinct to them. Do they resist? Do they resist change? Do they do they cause their own rest? Yeah, they they hold out against their inevitable death for you know for a good eight years if you're lucky, right? And and um and so they they resist entropy on their own, right? They can do it on their own. Okay. How about the desk I'm sitting at right now? Is that a natural thing? Well, 
Not really. Okay. Not, not at all. Okay. One, cause you know, we made it. Okay. Blah. But all this desk is doing is it's slowly decomposing, right? It's not pushing itself forward. It's not really resisting entropy in any active way at all. Right. It has nothing. It does all on its own to resist and prosecute its interests. Okay. So the desk would then be unnatural. It has no internal principle of change and rest. Okay. Um, and this, I think this is a very important issue for understanding all of Aristotle. And so then Aristotle then says, okay, so that's what a natural thing is. So, but what is the nature of a thing? What is it about it, right? Like what is of its, of its pr internal principles? What is it that is its nature, that, that is this internal cause of its motion and rest, okay? And so uh, Aristotle say, well, is it the matter? Well, no, because something could have the very same matter and not be a natural thing of that kind, right? So for instance, the cat's matter on the far side of the wood chipper is not pushing itself forward and it's not resisting entropy, it's just rotting, right? The wood in this desk, all this wood in this desk is doing is rotting. Okay. Um, so what the nature of a thing must be is its form. That must be the internal cause of its motion and rest. Okay. All right. Um, and so then, so you can see now, so suddenly now, if you want to know what something is for Aristotle, uh, it becomes, you want to know its form, right? That's its nature, not its matter. Okay. I mean, that, that matters part of it, right? Part of the story, but the most important story about it is its form. Okay. All right. So that's, the physics first two books, right? And then you go to the animal, right? And um, Aristotle starts asking, okay, so uh, about the forms of living things, okay? And that's the anima of a thing and what we translate as soul, okay? So what is a soul for Aristotle? It's just a special case of the form of a thing, right? So you have some things that are natural. So for instance, you know, water, uh, freezes, right? Water, you know, stays together under most conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So it has an internal principle of change, but it's not alive. Okay. It's not a living thing. Uh, whereas the chameleon, that's a living thing now. Okay. And he gives that form a special name. He calls it the anima, the life of the thing. Okay. So it's important to know. So for Aristotle, um, all natural things have souls, pardon me, all living things have souls. All of them do. Okay. Um, but we have to be careful though, because it's a lot more boring than it sounds, right? Because uh, all living things have souls, not as a secondary entity, right? That's another part interacting with their other parts, right? It's to say that they have something internal to them that uh, leads them to all on their own, pursue their final cause and resist death, right? Um, and, and they have a kind of substantial internal integrity in doing that, okay? Um, and then, you know, he starts asking about, you know, questions about form a uh, soul in general, and then he eventually applies it to human beings. Okay. And of course the human, the human way of pushing ourselves forward involves intellect, right? So then we get this story about intellect and mind is part of that. Okay. But no, we've gone, we have to go this whole way through the philosophy of nature to get to that point. Right. And then that's where he finally says, look, uh, a human intellect, a human soul, uh, because the, the, the final cause of human beings is to know, and Aristotle thinks that the thing most worth knowing is universal and eternal and unchanging, then it must be there's something about the human form that's universal and unchanging, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay. And I think this is, this is one of the, the, the difficulties in, in, in bringing hylomorphism into the philosophy of mind is you have to have that whole story. You have to have that whole story about all of nature, right? And I, and I think you need the teleological story mm -hmm. that, you know, um, as part of it, right? And so, yeah, is it theoretically heavy? It is, but it's comprehensive and it's consistent, right? Okay. And I think that's what most recommends it. Yeah, because I was going to ask you the, as the next question, what are some advantages yeah. or, you know, um, what, yeah. are, what are some reasons to accept this account over others? Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, no, did, did you have more? Well, I, I wanted to just uh, have some clarification first, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, I know I went a long way there, yeah. No, no, you're great, you're great, you're doing a great job. So, I, you know, two things that came up in my mind, right? So, one is that, you know, someone could say, well, Aristotle's definition of something being natural, right, has those two conditions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it has to resist entropy, 
and then it has yeah. to be directed towards its final cause. Yeah. Direct but, itself. Direct yeah. itself, right? In, yeah. Internal to it, right? So someone, but suppose someone says, well, what about substances, let's say like lava, right? Or like yeah. water, are those natural? Or would that count yeah, as something they're, else? They're natural. I would, okay, I would cool. Suspect, yeah, yeah. So they're not so then, alive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then, like, I, I was just wondering, like, someone might say, "Well, no, that 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 seems to resist Aristotle's definition," but you'd say, "No, it doesn't." I don't think it does. Yeah, I think okay. he has that sort of thing in mind. I mean, so fire. I mean, so he thinks, yeah. you know, fire is a kind of it's a, it's a substance. I mean, in a sense, it, it has a natural end; it goes up. Now we can argue with him about, you know, I see. that, right? But yeah, it, it has yeah. a natural end; it goes up, and and it and it resists becoming water like hell, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so yeah, that that would be a natural thing. Yeah. All right, great. So then that's a yeah, good clarification. And I think and, this is important. So he's got the same account. He in principle he gives of human beings. He gives of lava, right? Do, do, you know, I think that's that that's good science, right? All right. So my next question was about form itself. So, um, you know, so we're not we're not Platonists. We're not saying that you know material objects participate in the form of some other higher kind of you know dimension, if you will, or something of yeah. that sort. What we're saying is, is that the form is intrinsic to the substance itself, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, for someone who might have like an analytic background and yeah. they might say, well, look, I, I need this to be kind of reducible to more precise language or, yeah. you know, so forth. I mean, you can lay it all you want. Um, yeah. You know, is it the case that the form is, how do I put this? I mean, the, the, as I see it, the form is what makes the matter intelligible but yeah. it's almost like it's very difficult to assess it on its own, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Okay, so these are these are these are vexed issues for me too. Okay, um, I don't like talk, and I don't know how to how to refrain from this kind of talk of form of making matter do things because mm -hmm. you're turning the formal cause into the efficient cause now, right? Okay, um, and so this temptation to account for form as a special extra efficient cause we say form organizes matter that sounds like well it's like out of hands it's going to like you know wrap around and, and move right or, or the form makes matter it do things and you can find me all over my book saying that okay so i don't know i don't know how to get around saying that okay but form isn't the efficient cause right so it's it's not that which makes it intelligible it mm. is the intelligibility of the thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right now, but now, but now we're like we're on our way to all order of category mistakes that people have been accusing, you know, the scholastic tradition of as long as there's been a scholastic tradition. I think for good reason, right? This is okay. So, um, especially if you're going to say some of these forms are separable, right? Say in human in human beings, right? Okay. How can intelligibilities of objects be separated from those objects, right? Okay. Um, and you know, Aristotle, it seems, didn't think they were separable as individuals, right? Okay, so you know, basically, you know, he, he, he sees your, your soul and my soul in as much as they're getting to God, which was their final cause to know, is like they're kind of becoming God now, so they're all really the same thing, okay? Mm. Right. You know, Thomas likes individuated souls, right? Okay, but I have to admit, I mean, I'm... I am less confident I can make any sense of that than I was, you know, 10 years ago. Okay. St. Thomas's account or. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't have a, I don't have a terribly good objection to it. Okay. It's just that um, increasingly, you know, and I, I fight like hell to, to defend the intelligibility of separated souls in the book. Right. But increasingly, I think it just, it seems to me, and this is why I, I like that contact account. Like we are immortal in as much as we're in contact with something else. Okay. With this immortal thing. Um, but what does it mean for us to be separated then? I, I don't know. And I think we've got good reason to think that we are in as much as we become immortal in as much as we get God right. Okay. What does it mean? What will it be like? I, I think we're, I think for me now, I'm sort of, we're out of things we can say about that. Right? Mm. Um, where have you cannot speak <laughs> and move on in silence. Right. Okay. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that because like, you know, Thomas likes to talk about, individuated souls separate from the body right i want angels stuff like that i'm not saying i've got a knockout problem with that account right um though i i will say i'm not fully convinced by all that right mm -hmm. and i don't know why we need to give an account of that like why we can't say yeah it looks like human beings are in contact with something 
uh, that is immortal, right? Things that are in contact with things that are immortal have to become them in some sense. Um, and I'm not going to attempt to make deeper sense of that, right? Right. So, I mean, increasingly, I see myself as sort of a uh, hylomorphic anti-naturalist, okay? I think I can give a very good argument as to why a natural story is not the story about us, or the full story about us. Um, but I'm less confident that I can fill it in with much of a positive story. Yeah. Hmm. Right. But I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, my Christianity does not lead me to be surprised that there's a great big mystery wherever humans go. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it also reminds me just kind of, you know, how classical theists, we don't try and say, I mean, it's hard to say what God is. We have to first yeah. begin with negations and what he's yeah. not. Right. And, We're doing that with the soul too, I think. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's, that's, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> no, and I'm not, I'm not claiming this to be Thomas's view at all. I'm, I don't care yeah. with that before the light came out. <laughs> right. Okay. And, and I'm not claiming that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this with a great confidence, right? For, for me, the older I get, the more I'm kind of happy to have open-ended exploration, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and less of a need to identify myself with, with a particular school of thought and more just like, just kind of being into the questions. Yeah. Well, so then are there, uh, are there any other reasons that you can think of for why one should accept your account over other accounts or do we kind of hit everything? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, and, and also I want to be careful too, because I think our account of mind and our account of soul are different. Okay. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't think minds are souls. Okay. All right. I don't think souls are minds. Right. I think in virtue of having a human soul under certain conditions, animals like us develop minds. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, in virtue of having a chameleon soul under certain conditions, chameleon, you know, mind might be a certain chameleon, but they, you know, they, they develop a chameleon psychology or what have you or something like that, right? Okay, so I think I, I, I'm happy to give you an emergentist account of mind, right? Mm. But not of soul, okay? I mean, because soul, soul is an ultimate principle of things, okay? So, you know, what, what, yeah, so do I have a better argument for hylomorphism beyond just, you know, what is the best account of the unity of complex physical objects, I don't, right? But I find that pretty darn convincing. Right? Yeah. Right, okay. Um, and so, yeah, I, that, and, and once again, you know, when you start applying it across the board, it gives you a complete, coherent, consistent account of nature and living things and non-living things. Uh, I don't know how much more we're looking for in a metaphysical theory, short of complete demonstration, right? Yeah. But we've been holding out for that sort of thing for a long time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, okay. So then maybe um, just to, you know, help the audience understand, yeah. right. I think, um, what is it? The, the intellect is referred to as a power of the soul, right. Especially yeah. in rational yeah. animals. So maybe we should yeah. talk about how yeah. that, you know, the, the, the intellect, the will and so forth and mm -hmm. from the soul and uh, everything in that area. Um, so just introducing yeah. the audience yeah. to like to mystic psychology and, or, or just more fundamentally, like um, the intellect and the will. Sure. So, um, you know, in, okay. So, in general, you know, you know if Thomas will, will tend to sort of you know break the soul in different faculties, right? Okay. Uh, and I think better way to think it, I, I, how you put it, as much as put it, different powers. Okay. It's not. You have to be careful. You can't say there's like this piece of the soul is the will and this other piece of the soul is the intellect this other piece of the soul is the emotions because once again now you're like the metaphors are really bad because it's parts of a thing that's not you know parts of a part of a part and i don't want to think of the soul as a part right mm -hmm. so the way i would put it is in virtue of being the kind of thing we are okay which is to say of having the soul we have right uh, and i see those statements as, as more or less the same statement okay um we have certain capacities, right? Okay, and these capacities can develop to varying degrees under certain different conditions. And one of those capacities is the intellect, right? Which is the ability to know things. One of these capacities uh, in, you know, varied, right? Is the, are the emotions, right? The, the ability to, to be, to react to what comes in, right? So I mean, in, in Aristotle, emotional states in his categories go under passions, right? And you think, you know, think of the root of the word passion, passive, it's what you're receiving, right? So you generally don't make yourself angry. Someone else makes you angry, right? So we so we we have intellect, so we can build up accounts of things, right? We have passions, we have emotions, meaning we, we take things in and react to them in virtue of they're coming in. And then we also have the will, right? And what is the will? Well, the way I like to think about it is this thing that you know can look over here at what the intellect's doing and look over here at what the passions are doing 
right? And it can decide, you know, which way we're going to go, right? It can say, okay, passions, I know where you're guiding me. Will, I know where you're guiding, or excuse me, intellect, I know where you're guiding me. And uh, I'm going to form my passions according to uh, what's in my intellect, right? But once again, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to think of those as, you know, three little BBs we're going to find somewhere, you know, in us, right? They are, they're capacitors, they're powers that we have in virtue of being a human. All right. Um, and just one last piece of clarification, mm -hmm. too. I'm interested in um, where teleology uh, fits into your account of mind. So I've, I've seen some people talk about um, uh, in the philosophy of mind intentionality and aboutness being an instance of teleology, or at least, you know, teleology could really help inform that area. Uh, yeah. You know, just can, can you touch on that real quick? Sure. Okay. So I think, I think a lot of times, um, Purpose in the sense of intention and purpose in the sense, uh, let's say Aristotle is using it um, as the final cause, I think it conflated often, okay? Um, and so I, I, as a hylomorphist in general, I think, uh, what is it to have a certain kind of form? Okay, so what is it to have a human form? It's to be disposed to pursue under my own power certain goods for this kind of organism, right? So that would be to have a purpose, okay? And notice that doesn't necessarily mean a conscious purpose, right? Uh, you know, my body is do I'm doing all sorts of stuff right now uh, in virtue of being a human being that are aimed at, the, at human good, right? Human flourishing that are not conscious at all, okay? Mm -hmm. I have no known intention for doing these things, right? Uh, and some of them are, some of them aren't, okay? Um, and so I don't, I don't know how important that is for philosophy of mind. Okay. But I think that is, that's, you cannot get hylomorphism without thinking that there are certain states towards which organisms are disposed, right. That are for their good. Okay. All right. Um, now in, in philosophy of mind, we talk about intentionality. Very often what we mean is the fact that my thoughts particularly, right. Although I think a lot of times call you have intentionality too, but, but my thoughts primarily refer to something beyond the thought itself. Okay. So it's easy to do this with words, right? So if I write the word red on a whiteboard, right? Um, the, that word refers to something beyond that color, right? And, and maybe I wrote it in blue, maybe I wrote it in green, right? Does it's, it, it refers to something beyond itself. Okay. Um, and the question of intentionality is how the heck is it that, you know, one physical object can have, right intentionality right towards things that aren't it okay mm. um now i think you you might see some intersection between these two two concerns in that well there might be certain kinds of intentionality that are just natural to us in virtue of being human beings like our natural history endows us with certain dispositions to 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 counter interact with certain things in in, in our environment right but I don't think that solves this really weird thing about how, how the heck can those squiggles on a, on a dry erase board have anything to do with something colored red, you know, in Topeka, Kansas, right? Mm. As I write them here in, in Atchison. You, you see my point. Yeah. There, mm -hmm. right? I, think, I think so. I think most of those are separate problems, right? But I, I think intentionality, the, the latter problem, is, is for me one of the most striking problems in the philosophy of mind. All right. Well, so now to get to the last three questions yeah, that yeah, we have, yeah. right? So, I mean, one of them just deals with, are, are there any objections that you've encountered over the years that have kind yeah, of worried yeah, yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you bet. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and once again, I think, I think I've hinted like my, a lot of my views have kind of evolved a bit mm -hmm. since the book. Right. And, and a lot of it is, is, you know, I don't like mind body interaction and I really worried if we start thinking about, separated souls as entities uh and we can't get rid of those metaphors like this the form making the matter do things stuff like that that we're just ending up with cartesian dualism uh with a better story about nature right mm -hmm. okay um and so i really really worry about that problem i really worry about that problem okay uh i really still worry although i you know i i, I try to beat it in the book um with what do we mean by an individuated being of a thing, the actuality of a thing individuated distinct from that thing? Okay. I mm. worry about that. Okay. 
So those are two problems that I like go to bed thinking about every night. Right. You know, and in a lot of, um, you know, recent lectures I've given, I've, I've experimented with uh, trying to get by without anything like soul body interaction. Okay. And you know, I've been accused, I think, you know, for good reason of like going weak on Thomism, right? You know, cause I, cause I'm, cause I'm, I'm seeing the form, you know, so much less as a distinct entity, right. Than, than a lot of traditional Thomists do. And so, and once again, yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I'm experimenting with a lot of stuff. I really worry about that problem. Mm. Right. But on the other end too, I had a, a, a very interesting conversation with Mark Johnston from Princeton about a year ago. And he, he told me that, you know, cause I'm all, I'm worried about all this interaction stuff. And so I'm pushing hylomorphism, you know, uh, to get away from that. And, and he said, you know, but you're also making hylomorphism in, into nothing but polite materialism. <laughs> and, yeah. And, 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 and I said, oh, man, I, you know, I think you're right. Okay. You know, so, and I hate to be so wishy-washy on, on you, but uh, these are problems I do not know the answer to. Right. Um, and, you know, and, but I think these are problems that, you know, scholastics have been writing promissory notes on for, you know, five, 600 years now. These, these are the abiding problems of our, of our approach to things. And I think to act like we, they aren't problems is, is, is to make matters worse. Right? Yeah. But, but you would say that at least you, you think that the hylomorph, uh, the hylomorphism is the most promising direction to at least yeah. approaching yeah. the question. Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally, completely. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I, yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, there's going to be dangling problems in any metaphysical position, right? Okay, there's going to be, right? And I think the the only account to be given of material objects that, in general, is hylomorphic, okay? Mm -hmm. So, in as much as I'm a material object, and just for me, nothing could be more obvious than I'm a material object, okay? Um, then it's, I've got to find a way to give a hylomorphic story over human beings, okay? But I do think the hylomorphic story over human beings sort of terminates in a mystery, right? Okay, it, it, it mm -hmm. does, right? And, um, and I guess a lot of times when people say, well, well, what, you know, give me an explanation of this, right? How's this fit in? It seems like you really ultimately just want a kind of natural explanation, right? Mm. And I, I, it's not forthcoming, right? Um, and so for, for me, um, I'm, I'm getting just more comfortable with saying, yeah, humans just don't fit really well. <laughs> into this scheme, right? But it's the only, it, it seems to be the only scheme in town. So it turns out, right, uh, you know, just like the God we are the image of, right? We, we're kind of homeless here. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. All right, so then the yeah. next question is- and I, I know it's probably or, frustrating because yeah. you want, <laughs> want an argument. Right? I'm saying, no, I've been doing this for like 25 years and this is all I have, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. I mean, you know, kind of, just to tell you a little bit about myself and then yeah. we can get to the last two questions. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, you know, recently I, you know, when I started Thomism, I started, I, I entered through ethics and then mm -hmm. I gradually got into metaphysics and then natural sure. theology. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I started realizing you can't put the ethics first and then go to metaphysics. You gotta, yeah. you know, start. You better have those root. final causes. You better have those final causes <laughs> in your Thomistic ethics. Right? That's right. So, yeah. you know, um, yeah. So I did that and, you know, now I'm, I'm hitting a point on the show and in my own personal research where I'm, you know, reading about divine simplicity, reading about yeah. uh, the model of God that us Thomas have. And it, it, I'm starting yeah. to realize like, oh, wow, this is not reducible. This is not totally, um, uh, it's not, yeah, there's, there's an element of mystery. Yeah. And for a lot of people. Thomas is a lot spookier than we lead on. Yeah. Than he is, right? <laughs> I mean, you can find some spooky new agey stuff there if you want right <laughs> you know, yeah right yeah yeah and I, I just what i found was that um you know i think it's a father thomas joseph white he says mm -hmm. you know at some point you have to just you have to bow to the mystery yeah yeah, and, yeah. And, like, I mean, um, and that's like one of the wisest people i think walking around today too mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um, well you know, and, go ahead go ahead sorry i was just gonna say that that's all that i have to say about yeah. you know that the mystery the mystery yeah. part of all this so, you know, when I was an undergraduate, um, you know, I, I, I was primarily trained in Wittgenstein and Heidegger and the, going on pretty, I wanted to go on and do Heidegger in grad school. And then um, I ended up uh, doing my master's thesis on Wittgenstein and Pittsburgh school. 
uh, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind. And then I went on to uh, Purdue to get my PhD and uh, wrote a dissertation on, on Leibniz and ended up doing a chapter on, uh, two chapters on Thomas as part of that story that I was doing. And at the time I was returning to church. And so, you know, Thomas just, you know, it just, it, it made sense of that process to me in a way, right? Okay. And I think that the book, um, which had nothing to do with my dissertation. So I always wanted to do philosophy of mind, but you know, we were kind of told at Purdue that there's two people who are going to get jobs in philosophy of mind this year, and they're both at Princeton. So do something else, right? <laughs> okay. and, so, and so I always wanted to go back and do philosophy of mind. And and I think what I see mind, matter, and nature as is, and I and I think it stands up as this is it. I think it demonstrates that that Thomism is a legitimate, bona fide player in contemporary philosophy of mind. If I may, I mean, it's really arrogant for me to say that, okay? Mm. But that's the point of the book. Say, look, Thomism, you, you, you can't say it's a facile ignorance of what's going on in philosophy of mind. You can't say there isn't a case to be made for this. You can't say um, that, you know, it, it's, it, it's outdated, okay? And that's the, that's the point of the book, okay? What, I think the most perceptive reviewer of the book said, you know, this is a great piece of Thomism. And... Uh, you know, Madden does a great job of defending positioning against kind of objections, et cetera. And he's, in the last track, I said, but there's this kind of a weird, almost postmodern skepticism in Madden about this, where he very often says, you know, if you're going to go this route in Thomas, if you're going to, it's all tentative. And, I'll, and, and I said, yeah, you got it. Okay, so I'm, <laughs> I'm committed to these things. Okay, but I, I don't necessarily feel I've got a first order demonstration for all this stuff. You, mm. you see that, okay? And I and I'm happy to admit that there's a lot of mysteries here, and, I, and you see my point, right? And it's not it's not that I'm not committed to these things, right? Um, but you know, for me, it was very important to show that there's there's a way things can be made sense of, and this is legitimate, okay? Um, have we demonstrated it? I think the work is still being done, right? Yeah, right. Does that make sense? Right? Mm -hmm. And in you know recent years, I I've kind of gone back to a lot of the Wittgenstein stuff. Um, a lot and like right now I'm writing a book on um, Pittsburgh school philosophy and um, Wittgenstein and trying to square that with hylomorphism and stuff like that mm. okay so yeah well it's going to take a while so I'll send you a <laughs> chapter if you want right? sure sure um, I'd love it so, yeah, so I'm in, in a lot of like Hegel and Heidegger stuff I'm, I'm going back to a lot of that stuff so I'm trying to put it all together into a, into a picture now but um, I, I just think, I think you, you probably have a, a lot of youngish philosophers watching your podcast. And I, and I think, yeah, I would advise them to see their careers are hopefully going to be long. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and they should be open to, um, looking at all sorts of stuff you thought you would never look at again later on and, and being open to revision. And, you know, I love when Hillary Putnam, you know, he got accused for changing his mind too much said, I thought the point of philosophy was to be right, not consistent. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, um, and I think once you've you've really laid out something, you see is that's believable. I, that could work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a really good objection to it, and it's coherent, right? That then makes makes you much more confident in exploring other stuff. Mm -hmm. That's my view on Thomism. If I've got it in my background, it's my view, right? It's not going to be undermined. Uh, but now I'm totally open to exploring other stuff and revision and things like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, so then moving on to just yeah. uh, the last two questions, yeah. um, a lot of a lot of my friends who are into quantum mechanics or into yeah. the philosophy of mind, they talk about idealism a lot, and they've been wanting to know if there's a way to combine hylomorphism with idealism, yet like a hylomorphic idealism. You know, uh, was it on this on this channel? I talked to someone who studied, you know, uh, physics quite a bit uh, on their own, and they 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 came up with something like a hylomorphic idealist account, but I'm wondering, you yeah. know, your perspective on the yeah. question. So uh, I don't know about, about idealism. I, mean, I, I kind of, it depends what you mean by idealism. Just if you mean Barclay idealism, I think, I think hylomorphism is sort of the, the you know, the, the polar opposite of that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you mean something like Hegelian idealism, I think that's a more interesting question, right? So, you know, the, the, the notion that the, the, the natural world is just suffused with the same rationality that we find in the mind, mm. right? Um, I think there, that becomes interesting, okay? But, but I want to I go to the, the quantum mechanics stuff, and, and I want to yeah. be careful because, you know, I, yeah, the, the other people you've talked to in your podcast about that, you know, like you could fill books with what they know about that that I don't, okay? Um, but I did do a paper with a colleague of mine 
a while back, actually we published on a, on a website, which was a very sympathetic uh, um, account of the relationship between hylomorphism and uh, um, relativity and quantum mechanics, right? And I think they square really well, okay? So, you know, what does, what does Aristotle, what does Thomas say about matter? Well, um, the, the, the more you think of matter on its own, in, in precision from form, not that it ever occurs without form, but it, you know, when, you, when you conceive of it in precision from form, the less determinate it will be, right? Mm. The more it will be merely potential, right? And not an actuality, okay? And so what my understanding, what, what are we doing in quantum mechanics? We're getting that matter, right? And it's most precise, it, it, it's, it, it's most separated from the way we actually encounter it in informed living things. And what are we finding? It's potency, it's not actuality, okay? So I see that as a confirmation of much of what um, the Aristotelian tradition is saying. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, like the, the matter... And this, this is something I, I kind of, we should have talked about that we didn't come up, is that, that matter in and of itself, separate from form, has no substantial integrity of its own, right? Okay. Um, and I guess this is one of the reasons why I think hylomorphism might have a hope of overcoming mind-body interaction in a way that dualism doesn't, because uh, I'm very, I very much admire some of the work that people like Patrick Toner have done on, on he has a great paper called Emergent Substance. I, I cite it in the book quite a bit about how um, uh, on the Thomistic account, it's controversial whether this is Aristotle's view, okay, but on, on Thomas's account, you know, when elements are present in a living organism, they don't survive it as substances. So you know, just to use his, his view of elements, like the earth and the water and the fire and the air in your body is not present as earth, water, air, and fire. It's destroyed as it's consumed and then your body takes on the powers of that, okay, All right? Um, and so, like, um, so th the matter isn't this distinct thing that the form is interacting with, right? It's, it, it has its only potency to be a certain way and it only be that way in as much as it's informed, right? Okay, now, if, if we cut your finger off and it rots and it goes back to earth, okay, what you're getting is a substantial change there, all right? And that too, the matter is informed by something else now. Do you see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so once again, again, the point is, is that for a hylomorphous of a very traditional stripe, okay. Uh, and I've told people this is too high an expense to pay for hylomorphism. So that's maybe an objection to it, right? Um, you're you're going to say that matter has no integrity all its own. And it only has integrity. It's only intelligible. It's only quantifiable in as much as it's involved with form. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that as confirmed by quantum mechanics. Yeah, I see. I see. I mean, um, you know, in particular, some people talk about like the observer effect and yeah. they talk yeah. about, well, yeah. you know, does, does matter have this mind independent existence or does it always depend yeah. upon a mind in some sense or, you know? Um, so, okay. Yeah. No, no, no. Look, the observer effect is, I mean, it, okay. First of all, if you want to know, if you want a story, okay, why not be a materialist? Okay. There. Bang, <laughs> right? I mean, the, <laughs> if, what, if what you mean by materialist is something that we can give a, a nice, neat, mechanized account of everything, well, guess what? You can't, right? Okay, the, the universe is a lot more freaking mysterious than you ever thought it was, right? Okay, <laughs> but uh, if, if, if I were running universities, that would be like the first thing we teach people in their freshman year of college is, <laughs> mm. is that, right? But anyway, um, one of the ways I've seen the observer ex um, effect explained and I know that everybody's got their explanation of this, is to say um, what this shows is that the particles don't have a definite actuality unless they're involved in a system. And they could be involved in the system by me observing it, or they could be involved in the system by, you know, being incorporated in an organism or something like that, right? So what's a, full, what's a system? It's an organization. It's a form, right? And so I, I see that, you know, you could, you could see this in Aristotelian, it is in as much as you're observing the particle, it's become a part of a world, a system, right? And then it has being, right? It's become informed in a way, right? Whether or not it means there's literally this essence being going from my eyes to that, I don't, I don't, I'd rather not think of it that way, but, but once again, you know, mm. it, it's hard to figure out how not to think of it that way. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's just, it, it's open, yeah. right? There, yeah. there, there's a possibility. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you have quantum mechanics, discussions where idealism comes up, 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I think very often people aren't saying we're just thinking the world, right? Okay, I think I think what they're saying is, um, you know, that that okay, who was it? it was it was a uh, was it Michael Dummett gives an interesting argument for theism based on this? Uh, I'm I'm not fam- I'm not sure. Yeah, I think he does. Okay, I think he does. Michael Dummett's a very interesting guy in a lot of ways. Okay, and a Catholic too, I think. Right. Um, where he says, you know, look, if there's a fact, this is not his example, I think this is what he's up to. He says, there's a fact of the matter of what's going on on the dark side of the moon right now. But none of us are aware of what's going on on the dark side of the moon right now. It would then seem, you know, by quantum mechanics, there must be somebody thinking about what's going on on the dark side of the moon, right? Mm. And then therefore, right, you know, God must be thinking about it, right? Um, I don't know how different that is than to say that everything depends for its existence on God, right? And um, God, you see what I mean? And God is, you know, not interacting with the world in this, you know, mechanical billiard ball push pull way, right? You, you see that? Okay. So it's not as if like you and I are dreaming the world into existence, but I have no problem saying, as be very careful, that in some sense, the world is God's dream, right? <laughs> do, do, do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so in that way, if you want to say it's, like, it's idealism in that way, that's all dependent on so-called mental acts by God, right? Fine, right? I don't think it shows me that it's dependent on mental acts by humans. I see, yeah. All right, so then getting to the last question about, um, you know, how how your view would inform us about Thomistic Christology, right? Yeah. Um, You know, was it uh, the last time on the show I had, um, you know, uh, what was it, I had, I had uh, Christopher Tomaszewski and um, Joe Schmid talk about, um, the incarnation from a classical theist perspective, yeah. right? And, you know, apparently there, there are objections that, oh, well, you know, you're making a change in God, right? And your theory is supposed to deny that or, you know, yeah. so on and so forth. But I'm interested in how you would approach the question of Christology, you know, Christ's intellect and, you know, his soul and yeah. so forth, all that. So yeah. what's your take on it? Okay, I'm really disappointed here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I generally just don't think much about those kinds of issues. I see, yeah. Okay. And I'll give you, give you some, so uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, it was a, I think it was a popular article where someone had asked her, you know, what do you tell your kids about the Eucharist? And she's like, well, I don't tell them anything. I take them to mass, right? And I tell them to be quiet, right? You know, and, I, and okay. And so, um, and, 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 and I think this is kind of a more general expression from her Wittgensteinian view is like, I'm not sure I can assign any real intelligible content to, to, to like what's going on there. Right. But yet uh, I still believe it. Okay. Um, okay. And so a lot of the creedal theological stuff, I'm not sure I really understand it. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure that it is understandable. Okay. Um, in the same way, I think a lot of the stuff that goes on in like quantum mechanics, I don't understand it. Okay. So what I'm doing, what am I doing in quantum mechanics? I'm just piggybacking on other people's understanding, right? I'm, I'm saying, look, I'm taking your word for it, right? That this makes sense, okay? And I have a similar view about a lot of the creedal theological issues, right? Is I'm, I think this is what faith is. Mm-hmm. I, think this, I think this is what it is to be a Roman Catholic in a lot of ways, right? Is I'm taking your word for it, that you guys are getting this right. I'm not even sure I know what it means, okay? but I see it's for it's my life and I take your word for it, right? I'm not saying no one understands it, but I don't think I do, right? But I don't think I have to yeah. to be a good Catholic, right? In the same way, I don't think I have to understand really what's going on in quantum mechanics in order to be sort of a, a, an informed, educated person, right? Mm-hmm. You know, at some point, I'm, I, I'm, I'm taking a risk, I'm deferring to the right people, right? And I think it just so happened like it, with Christology, I'm deferring to people who were alive in the third century. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. But I mean, but that's the act of faith. Okay. So, um, and, and so I, I have, I really have not moved into that stuff at all. Okay. Hmm. I'll say this. If you want to talk about that, I think you should get Michael Gorman on here. Michael Gorman. Okay. Yeah. From Kathy. He wrote a great book. I haven't read it because once again, I don't think it was, <laughs> but um, a couple of my colleagues just really love this book. Um, on on Christology from Thomas' standpoint, he, Michael has a very sophisticated view of hylomorphism, and I know it, it's very operative in what he's doing. He's been out here at Benedict, and he's a great guy. So if I were you, I would track down Gorman. 
All right. Um, and and he would and he's, he he'd love to talk to you about it. All right, thank you. Yeah. And now well, that I said it on the internet, right? He's he's stuck now. Right? <laughs> yeah, Calling he, me out, Mike. Yeah. yeah, he can't he can't escape now. All right, well, Jim, thank you so much for um yeah, thank you, yeah for man. this interview. Um, is there yeah, anything you want to say before again. we end the episode? Or no, no, uh, I, I'm I'm honored that you wanted to talk to me. And uh, if you want to talk again, by all means, uh, we'll do it. If you want to talk about Pittsburgh school and and uh, and 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 uh, possible intersections with homomorphism, we could do that too. All right. Thank you. Cool. You bet. Keep up your good work, man.